Hello everyone. Welcome to this exciting webinar titled Land Rights for Slum Dwellers in Orissa, Making Technology Work for the Urban Poor. My name is Narayan and uh, I teach at Azim Premji University in Bangalore, India. I will be moderating this webinar, which is uh, organized jointly by the government of Odisha, Tata Trust, Azim Premji University, the Kadista Foundation, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, NRMC Center for Land Governance, and the Land Portal Foundation. As I mentioned earlier, this uh, webinar is on a project launched by the Eastern Indian state of Odisha to give secure land rights to slum dwellers through a legislative act called Odisha Land Rights to Slum Dwellers Act 2017. Although the project itself is very region specific and local, it has significance beyond the region. It has drawn on, on some of the global best practices in its design and implementation. And uh, the lessons learned from this project have much wider policy and uh, academic implications. As we all know, providing uh, Slum dwellers with the secure land rights is a challenge faced by many countries all over the world. And therefore, uh, lessons from a successful project like this uh, needs to be understood in uh, greater detail. The project is quite unique also for um, very innovative use of technology. While it has used unmanned aerial vehicles or drones, for mapping slums, data collection was done using GIS and other advanced technological applications. It is perhaps for the first time in India that uh, drones are being used to create high resolution maps of slums. The objective of uh, this webinar, uh, therefore, is to understand this project and its significance in uh, detail by focusing on uh, certain specific areas, which include uh, first, the evolution and the context of the project. Second, the innovative use of technology in its design and implementation. Third, the multi-stakeholder partnership that uh, the project has forged. And uh, finally, uh, lessons and uh, research opportunities that emerge from uh, this project. To discuss all of these and uh, more, we have a panel of experts with us. Let me now introduce them. Uh, our first panelist is uh, Mr. G. Mati Vadanan. He is the principal secretary in the Department of Housing and Urban Development in the state of Odisha. Mr. Mati Vadanan has been in charge of uh, the implementation of this project uh, right from its inception. Our second panelist is uh, Professor Amita Bide. She is the Dean of the School of Habitat Studies in the Tata Institute of uh, Social Studies in India. Uh, we have also with us uh, Mr. Frank Pichel from uh, Kedasta Foundation US. And finally, we have Mr. Shishir Das uh, he is from the Tata Trust, um, which has partnered with the government of Odisha in the implementation of this project. Okay, so that is the panel uh, for today. And uh, the panel members will speak for the first one hour or so in response to the questions that I'm going to ask them. Then the panelists will address the questions from participants. May I request uh, the participants to use uh, uh, questions feature on your screen to post your questions. Uh, we will ensure that your questions are addressed during uh, the open discussion. Uh, well, with this background, uh, let me ask the first question to Mr. Mati Vadanan. Uh, Mr. Mati Vadanan, uh, can you give us uh, an idea about uh, the context in which the project has emerged and uh, what are its main objectives? Uh, I mean, is it uh, uh, limited only to the provision of land rights to slum dwellers 
or uh, is it also aimed at uh, improving their overall uh, standard of living? Mr. Mathiwadhanan. Hi, Darren. Hi. Well, yes, please go ahead. All the time, the provision of modern land and lack of land tenure have deprived town dwellers from getting housing assistance from government and other basic essential civic infrastructure, amenities, and services from the municipal authorities. Apart from that, the slum dwellers always need the routine of demolition and eviction of their houses and have Realizing the significance of their contribution to the city's existence and growth, and given the fact that they provide all the labor and manual workforce necessary for the functioning of the households and the city life, our government came out with a landmark and historic act, which is the Odisha Land Rights to Slum Dwellers Act 2017, which ensures the conforming of land titles to the slum dwellers on in situ basis, that is, wherever they are residing in tenable lands. In case of non tenable lands, such as forest lands, railway lands, defense lands, they will be moved into a new habitat in the nearby vicinity with their full consent. The Act covers around 109 towns having more than 3,000 slums with 200,000 households benefiting 1 million population. We are in the process of issue of land titles and as of now, we have already distributed 40,000 land titles to the eligible slum dwellers. And by the end of this month, we target to distribute around 60 to 70,000 land titles. Well, some of the slums uh, we found are in untenable lands which cannot be settled with the slum dwellers. And uh, as per our calculation, around 668 such slums would be moved to a new habitat with tenable land status where land titles can be given. In the course of the implementation of the Act, during the confirmation of land titles, we realized that mere settlement of land titles will not be able to make such impact in their living standard unless we work on a dedicated vision to upgrade the housing and other civic infrastructures and of course amenities. We realized that and we conceptualized and rolled out a mission called Jaga Mission to transform the slums into livable habitats, which will have all essential infrastructure, amenities, and of course, services. Accordingly, Jaga Mission is now under implementation in all the open areas of the state, covering 3,000 slums, 350,000 households, covering 1.8 million population. So the basic objective is to transform the slums into livable habitats, not Providing a land title in piece, in, a, in a piece of paper. Thanks, Narayan. Okay, uh, thanks, Mr. Mathiwadanan. Uh, that uh, is a nice summary of uh, the context uh, and the main features of the project. Uh, can I now ask uh, the next question to Professor Amita Bide? Professor Bide, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we hear. Uh, about this project is that uh, it is really inclusive in its approach. Uh, how do you think the project contributes to this uh, goal of realizing inclusive development uh, in Odisha? Thanks, Narayana, for this question. Uh, yeah. So I have two, three reasons why I think, and in the ways that this project will contribute to the overall objective of inclusive development. The first is really that Odisha is what is a opportunity state. Uh, opportunity state ki, because on one level, ki, while the proportion of urbanization in Odisha is growing consistently, at the same time, it is still at a fairly moderate level in relation to several of the other states in the country. 
The second implication of being an opportunity state is really that most of the towns in Odisha are currently small and medium towns. And which means that we have a great opportunity to take action with respect to the issues linked to uninclusive or exclusive urban development or one that generates exclusion. Um, and I think this program is therefore at just the right timing in order to not only do something about existing slums, but also to do something about the future development of slums. Now, how does it do this? Uh, so one of the first uh, principles really which has been followed in the program is its beginning with uh, the entire land titles program. And one has to see this against an uh, overall context in India where in most states of the country, slum dwellers are treated as encroachers, illegals, informals, and therefore really as half citizens. They're also continually vulnerable to evictions which are conducted by different state authorities. Uh, the state of their services is extremely unequal in relation to the rest of the citizens. Now here, giving them land titles uh, first gives them security. It does away with the fear of evictions. Uh, it makes them into right-bearing citizens who can demand from different generations of city governments. Having a land title in your name is being, brings you benefits which are not just limited to this generation but it can carry over into multiple generations. Moreover, I think we need to also think of the overall context of basic services. Okay? Having made slum dwellers as formal citizens of the city, the program doesn't stop there, but then it moves on to a define a minimum standard of living for all citizens in the city, not just slum dwellers and then begins to progressively make an increase in their living standards in a comprehensive manner. The basis for future planning of the city thus becomes, it begins with inclusion and moves towards equity. I don't think any other state in the uh, country has so far attempted to be so far reaching in its overall goals. And I think this perhaps may be, if successful, one of the biggest contributions of this program to the overall project of inclusive development. Thanks, thanks, Professor Bide, for uh, nicely speaking out uh, how the goal of inclusive development is helped uh, by projects like this. Uh, let me now uh, move on to uh, the technological aspects of, um, of uh, uh, the project. Uh, the question is to Mr. Frank Pichel. Uh, so, Mr. Pichel, uh, please tell us how in innovatively uh, technology has been used in the project uh, uh, for slum mapping, data collection, and uh, uh, networking purposes. Uh, Mr. Frank Pichel, yeah. Excellent. Well, th thanks for that question, Narayanan. And, it, and it's actually, it's a very interesting one because I would say that it's not the technology itself that I see as the biggest innovation. Um, you know, we've seen many of the tools applied with this project used around the world, whether that's UA, UAVs and the imagery from their, from those, satellite imagery, GIS and cloud computing, or, or mobile phone applications. What really made the project a, a success was in part using these technology, technologically appropriate tools in combination. But, uh, but more importantly, it's been the, the government support at all levels. These tools have all been used around the world, but, but this government support made the difference from the recognition of a need to adopt a new policy that would allow for, for, for the recognition of informal rights 
to the execution of that policy, and then the willingness to test and try new approaches. And then when something works, the ability to quickly integrate these new tools or approaches into a process and ensure that all government agencies supported the process. And that, that really can't be understated. It, it's not easy to, to change entrenched systems, processes, and, and, and staff, um, uh, staff skill sets with new technologies, but, but the government did manage to pull this off. So before giving any credit to the technology, it's probably first better to give some, some credit to the government, government and governance structure and leadership that allowed for the state to, to quickly pass the act and then get the buy-in from all levels. But as we, we look at the technologies that were used, there were a number of, of core tools that really made the project a success. You know, first was the, the use of extremely high resolution drone imagery. So we're, we're talking imagery that is, um, you know, uh, precise to three to five centimeters and really allows for contextualization of the area. And being able to use that imagery to identify parcel boundaries in the very built up urban environment where each building abuts one another and a traditional survey instrument would be almost impossible to use, the drone imagery made it possible to digitize the boundaries. I think we'd also all agree that um, looking at a, a sketched polygon on the backdrop of an imagery is much more um, accessible and useful for most people than, than looking at a, a list of coordinates or a polygon that just exists uh, on a blank sheet of paper. So the drone imagery really made the process more participatory and inclusive with the community. Um, it, you know, it became very clear that the rights were being captured ac accurately and appropriately. It just brings a lot more trust into the process. Now, in addition to the drone imagery, we used mobile technology and mobile applications from, from Cadasta. Um, and these tools were designed to be simple yet powerful enough to allow the members of the community themselves to become data collectors. And more importantly, again, was the government's willingness to trust that these local citizens are often best placed to capture the information. These members of the community have the, have the trust of the community, the local knowledge, and as compared to an outsider coming in, they're going to be able to um, operate much more effectively and efficiently. Now, the data, that's not to say the data is that not reviewed. Of course, that data comes in and is still reviewed and validated by land professionals. So we know that it's meeting the necessary government requirements. Now, in addition to the drone imagery and mobile applications, uh, the, the ability to quickly communicate with field teams was critical. And we used a, a, a ubiquitous tool that I think everybody's probably aware of, WhatsApp. And that you know, was great because it allowed for real, very real-time communication. And it's a tool that people are already using. It didn't require additional training or account setup. It was simply sharing, sharing contact information and getting on with the work. And finally, I'd, I'd say being able to bring all of this data together and integrate it into a GIS that allowed the data to be shared, analyzed, contextualized with historical information, and then accessed by the relevant gov government agencies. So it was this combination of tools um, compounded by government support that allowed a tremendous amount of work to, to be accomplished in a very short period of time. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Mr. Pichel, uh, for giving us uh, your views on the technological innovations of the project. But what I really, really like is you also touched uh, uh, on um, the governance structures and uh, the leadership issues, which really made the use of technology possible. Possibly, uh, I would, uh, I would come back to these issues later uh, in one of the, uh, to my, in, 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 in my questions to one of the, one of the panelists. Uh, anyway, so uh, let me move on. The the next question is to Mr. Shishir Das. Uh, so, Mr. Das, uh, uh, can you enlighten us on some other innovations used in this project, mainly the kind of partnership and the capacity building strategy that it has adopted? Yeah, thanks, Narayan. Uh, the project uh, from the beginning adopted a multi-stakeholder partnership strategy. The slum community are the foundation of uh, this project. Each slum community is mobilized to form a slum dwellers association. And the members of this slum dwellers association drives the entire process 
right from identification of the slum boundaries to household level survey till the time land rights is given they became the as the they became uh, continue as the co travelers about 27 civil society organizations were partner for data collection at the field level and validation and about 6 to 700 field facilitators were hired by the state government to collect the data from the field networking with knowledge partners from the private sector is crucial to the success of the project the involvement of private technical agencies for slum mapping and gis related activities has already brought innovation technique by combining high tech drone survey with ground level physical verification of slum settlements by the ngo and the members of slum dwellers associations some of the private agencies like tata trust kadasta foundation omidyar network and the tata institute of social sciences with its vast experience in the field of uh, property rights has contributed significantly through its resources technology and knowledge sharing this collaborative approach has brought together unique strength and in that sense the implication has been able to best practice has been able to draw the best practices from some of the most sophisticated land titling program globally the capacity building program were also organized in this program to a massive number of stakeholders under this project about 2700 stakeholders has been trained on spatial data management as well as collection of data from the field and how to integrate the information that has been collected from the spatial data as well as from the field this implementation process was based on the learnings from the pilot and all the stakeholders have participated very actively throughout the project thanks narayan Th thanks mr das uh, uh, the the partnership uh, and capacity building strategies that uh, you have just elaborated uh, uh, really seem uh, interesting um, uh, you know let, let let me ask a few more questions about that uh, uh, later uh, but uh, uh, for now let us go back to mr mati vadanan uh, and try to get some more ideas about uh, the use of technology uh, mr mati vadanan uh, what made you uh, think of using this drones for slum mapping and uh, what are some of the specific problems that you could uh, uh, could could overcome because you are using drones uh, which otherwise would have been uh, difficult to tackle thank you narayan uh, this uh, unmanned aerial vehicles that is the drones were used in the survey to produce very high resolution images which were used to geofence existing slum boundaries the auto maps produced using these high resolution maps images captured the minutest in the details of the slum like streets trees footprints of the buildings or houses areas of the land occupied by the individual households open spaces present in the slum etc auto maps are very accurate in terms of measurement of the area of the land occupied by the slum and the land occupied by each households the auto maps are integrated with the existing cadastral maps and revenue record of rights to identify the revenue plot on which the slum exists and to decide if the land is tenable or non tenable as the survey will result in giving land rights to the uh, individual slum dweller accuracy of the survey process and public perception of the survey process are very important factors as the community saw the drone survey process in the field later on they saw the images and maps and got convinced that it is scientific accurate and free from manipulations drone survey played an important role and communities reposed complete trust on the findings of the drone survey this resulted in zero dispute i reiterate zero dispute or zero litigation in the whole process and though we have settled almost 40000 land titles so far not even one appeal petition or dispute has been filed so far challenging the decision on the land titles that clearly shows the success of the drone based survey and the strength of the community consultation process and the fairness and transparency adopted in the implementation of this program thank you all right thank you narayan 
thanks thanks uh, uh, mr mathi wadan uh, it's it's really interesting uh, to know uh, how the use of drones helped avoiding disputes and uh, the fact that it was a kind of you know zero dispute situation was uh, is certainly something that one needs to pay special attention to um anyway so uh, let us now move on to the the research opportunities uh, arising from the project uh, by bringing in professor bide again uh, professor bide uh, how do you think the the spatial and uh, household data generated in this project uh, can be sort of used for future research professor bide Hello, Professor Bide. Please go ahead. Yeah. You got my so, question. I did. I did. Yeah. Thank you. Please go. Please, please go ahead. Please go. Yeah. Thanks. So the sheer amount of data which has been collected by this entire exercise, uh, already explained by both Shishir and Mr. Mathiwatnan, um, and the kind of methods which have been used, lead to tremendous research opportunities. So let me uh, perhaps confine currently my response to basically three areas of research inquiries. Number one, uh, what is a slum? Um, now this is a very important question because the definitions of slums have always been uh, approached in a very normative manner, uh, uh, world over, or whether by data sources like census, etc. And there is one standard definition which has been imposed on slums. However, this collection of data gives us, first of all, an opportunity to inquire uh, what is the kind of diverse conditions uh, that we are actually calling a slum. What about the slum is actually a problem? Uh, uh, is it the land title only? Uh, is it in terms of the um, uh, lack of space or the area of the land or perhaps lack of open spaces or perhaps it is none of these but a basic just sheer denial of basic services and this gives us clues then to how things can be also corrected in the long run it also gives us an idea and insight into saying that a slum may not be one thing in one town but it can be many things in many towns and perhaps lead to a more comprehensive understanding of how this term, how this concept has actually been deployed. The second area of inquiry is what is life in a slum? Uh, government data has never bothered with this question of what is life in a slum? How do people get basic services? What is the kind of housing that people live in? Uh, what are their basic priorities and needs? Uh, what is the connection between housing and livelihood and the arrangements of space which happen within? What are the kinds of associations which happen? And I think currently this entire uh, merger in some ways of social data with the spatial data gives us again tremendous opportunity to develop a baseline and perhaps as we move into the future into the program, to understand what difference we make to this baseline. And this brings me to my final uh, area uh, of research inquiry, and which is in terms of what is the difference that participatory programs and participatory processes, as well as the material benefits, uh, what are the impacts that they make on the slum community? How does it change the entire relationship between a slum and the rest of the city. Uh, does the provision of a minimum basic standard raise the city to a new standard? And I think these are all new and new areas which I think we will get insight into as we move uh, ahead in this program. Uh, uh, thanks, Professor Bide, for uh, highlighting uh, uh, the research possibilities uh, you know uh, that can 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 arise using uh, uh, this, this project data. Um, may I may I now ask uh, Mr. Frank Fitchell uh, to chip in and uh, uh, 
Mr. Pichel, do you think uh, you know you would like to add uh, more? What uh, Professor Bide said. Uh, what other kind of uh, research possibilities you think is possible using the data? Certainly. Uh, th thanks for that, Narayana. And, and Professor Bide certainly captured many of the key issues that can be looked at in more detail. Um, because, as she mentioned, the government really ha now has a data set on, on places and people that were previously informal, not on the map, and, and almost seen as irrelevant. Bringing them into the formal and ca capturing all of this data opens up tremendous possibilities. Um, a, a key area of interest for, for us at Cadasta is this the impact of this um, somewhat intermediate form of tenure. You know, it's a first step of bringing citizens into formality for the first time. And, and ultimately, how is this changing the relationship between citizens and state as these citizens that were previously informal now have a, a right to demand these services and recognition? So it'll be very interesting to see how this affects, um, you know, self-esteem of individual or the effect on broader family re relations. But we're also very interested to see what the impact of certificates um, has been as compared to other forms of tenure, including the complete informality that most of them knew. You know, are these certificates leading to uh, a reduction in land conflicts? Are we seeing changes in the investments people make in their property? Or are we seeing changes in, in socioeconomic factors, health, education, um, status of women in society? And, and from our side as well, how's this affecting the perception of tenure security? And being able to compare that to the, the, the metric from Prindex, you know, presents a great context to do so. Um, and as we look at the, the government perspective, we're very interested in looking at how the different departments responded and how, how the process could be improved and expanded going forward. You know, because the mission really innovates at multiple levels, there, there's so much to really look at. And then finally, I might mention the, the planning data. Having access to this data and, and hopefully being able to integrate it into the city planning will, will be incredibly useful. Are our citizens going to receive better services? Are they able to, to leverage their recognition of rights to demand those services? Does the government, uh, can the government deliver the, these services more cost effectively with the data? Um, so again, just to, as the professor previously uh, mentioned, there's there's so much we, we with the amount of data now captured, the, the research, uh, research opportunities are, are boundless, but those are just a few we'd like to see investigated further. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Mr. Pichel, for uh, placing before us the entire canvas of uh, research possibilities that the that the project has created. Uh, before I move on to the next question, uh, may I request uh, the participants to send in their question? Uh, we have plenty of time uh, to address your questions. Please do uh, send uh, your questions using the questions feature on the uh, on on the screen. Uh, so uh, my my next question is to Mr. Shishir, Shishir Das. Uh, so, Mr. Das, uh, what do you think are some of the best practices uh, you think have been adopted in this project, and uh, also what are the main learnings uh, uh, from the from the project? Uh, well, uh, uh, let me discuss some of the early learnings from the project uh, because it's. Uh, just execution of uh, one and a half years of the project. Uh, so let me discuss some of the early learnings. The first learning was the uh, project adopted a strong accountability framework during the execution of the project. The legislation, the legislation is unique in its determination to provide services at the doorstep of the beneficiaries and stick to the time frame. It was deliberately designed not to bring beneficiaries to the government offices. It adopts community-based approach with focus on doorstep delivery of services, wherein the urban local bodies and NGO partners are visiting the slums and collect the household information. The project has already delivered landline certificates to about 50,000 families at their doorstep. The project also used technology and partnership with different resource organizations for efficient delivery of services in a time-bound manner. This shows that Accountability lies at the core of such commitments and establishing this framework that outline accountability. The second learning that uh, what we have uh, got from the project is 
a critical need to invest upfront upfront on alignment and on creating tighter management protocols given the novelty of the program there is no existing template to ensure success however clarity in laying out roles management structure and creating standard operating process in parallel will not only ensure a smoother process but also serve a credible public good to other states or programs with similar aspirations the third learning in from the project and from the execution is that the project aims to promote sustainable development of habitat with a view to ensure equitable equitable supply of land shelter and services at affordable prices to all sections of the urban poor urban poverty being multi dimensional various vulnerabilities faced by the poor in cities and towns occupational residential and social needs to be addressed simultaneously in a comprehensive and integrated manner through odisha livable habitat mission the fourth uh, uh, at the final learning by early learning is that the urban local bodies ngos and slum dwellers association are the main stakeholders for execution of the land rights act and transformation of slums to livable habitats it requires skill and expertise both in areas of community participation and mobilization and in the areas of special data collection and management networking with knowledge partners from the private sector is crucial to uh, crucial for the success of this project the uh, the project has uh, confirmed to these uh, conditions and uh, proved to be as one of the very successful project odisha leads the way in coming becoming the first state to validate the needs for future forward technology such as drone and geospatial tool in deliver in delivery and implementation of large scale systemic programs such as land lands land rights and livable habitat there are future collaboration for research and documenting the learning from the project one of the heartening learning from the project is that after using all this technology it is one of the low cost project for execution like for each family we have spent about 800 rupees and the beneficiary has got 30 to 60 square meter of land and housing support and other infrastructure support for each household thanks uh thanks thanks mr das uh, uh, for uh, listing out the main learnings from the project uh, before we move on to the questions from uh, our viewers um, uh, let me ask a question to mr mativan mativadanan again uh, what is the significance of uh, going through this legislative route why was uh, uh, a separate act of the legislature required uh, for a project like this uh, wouldn't uh, uh, it uh, have been possible through an executive order land titling <clears throat> cannot be the objective of giving land title to the slum dwellers cannot be achieved through any other means so legislation the state act is the only way to uh, achieve that objective that is why we decided that we need to bring a separate act in fact when we thought about it there were options like amending the existing acts to provide for this then we realized that the existing acts are all enforcement act so this has to be a welfare act so for a, the, the the welfare aspect of an act should not be you know mingled with an, an ordinary act which largely deals with the land management and enforcement of the land resources so we thought that we need to have a, a an exclusive act that's why we bring out this welfare act and the the objective is to confer the land right to a slum dweller if the land right cannot be settled then this act does not deal with the eviction or uh, you know uh, uh, removal of the the encroachment or the slum if it is possible to uh, uh, confer the land right we will confer and uh, provide all the infrastructures if it is not possible then we will leave the people like that we should not disturb them so we have we have we, we, we have framed in that way in that way it's a it's a welfare act it's a very brief act and uh, it provides for all and then uh, we made it workable and then in the last uh, well, uh, less than you know one and a half years we have delivered almost 45000 uh, land right uh, certificates and we demonstrated that is a workable act and we are very happy about it thank you 
Okay, uh, that that's really good to know. Uh, you know, I, I have one more question for you, uh, which is, um, you know, this act and this project takes care of the needs of the existing slum dwellers, right? So, uh, you know, uh, how do how does the Odisha government ensure that in the future, uh, you know, no more no such slums come up? Or do you have any you know precaution taken uh, either through this project or uh, some some addition to this? to ensure that in the future we don't have the repetition of the problem? See, our uh, uh, thinking is that if you address the present problem, which is an accumulated problem over decades, if you are able to address the problem, if you are able to, you know, provide uh, the, the, the uh, uh, you address the issues of uh, slum dollars, provide land, land title, provide shelter, provide other infrastructure facilities, and then transform them into a livable habitat, and then, then, then uh, you know uh, the 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 migration you cannot you know prevent. The migration is a continuous process. Depending upon the opportunities available in the urban areas, the migration happens. The pace of migration only differs, varies. So once the present problem, huge uh, quantity of problem is addressed, then the the future addition will we will be able to handle. The government to, that that will not be much difficult for the government to address. The, only the present uh, magnitude is so alarming that the, the gov governments, you know, you know, shy away from addressing it. Once we have decided to address this huge problem, enormous problem, then addressing the incremental problem should not be uh, an issue in future. We'll, we should be able to identify lands for expansion of this land, you know, for the new uh, communities to move in, new entry entrance into the city to find a place, to find a shelter. So I think those things will be able to, we will, will be able to address that. Thank you. Okay. 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 That's that's really good to know. Uh, I have more questions uh, for you, and also many of our participants have questions for you. But uh, before that, uh, there's a question from one of the participants to Mr. I, uh, to Mr. Dash or uh, uh, Professor Bide. I think uh, I'll I'll post this question to Professor Bide. So the the question is this. Uh, the question is from uh, uh, somebody called Michelle McMillan. Uh, is there any interest at the Tata Institute to do an impact evaluation on uh, how this project contributed to the provision of public services? Uh, Professor Bide, would you like to take this up? Yeah, sure. Uh, see, certainly there is interest from Tata Institute to uh, undertake an impact evaluation of this project. But I think for the impact evaluation to take place, uh, one will still need to wait, I think, for at least a year to see that uh, the definition of minimum uh, livable habitat and the operationalization of that, all of that unfolds on ground. Currently, I think it is the first phase, which is of issuing of land titles, which has actually happened. Okay. The second response that I have is, um, I would see and define impacts as not just a end of the day or the end of the program kind of process, but actually to also see the and understand and document the entire process of how communities participate, what is their uptake of the different projects, uh, what are the forms that participation uh, takes from moving from an individual level to a settlement level to a town level, uh, and what sense of empowerment does that give them uh, what are the material benefits of the program uh, and how do they uh, um, uptake that? Their dynamics within this. How does the local governmental system and uh, different kinds of vested interests in uh, towns respond to these? So these are all process questions, perhaps, which are extremely critical um, and which need to be understood as well. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Professor Bide. Uh, we have another question. Uh, this is from a participant, Mega Datta. Uh, this may be taken by um, Mr. Mativadanan or uh, Mr. Dash. Um, the question is, uh, who were the key stakeholders involved and uh, what were their specific roles? Um, would uh, Mr. Mativadanan uh, like to take this question uh, about the stakeholders and their specific roles? Stakeholders, you know, the, uh, at the implementation level, the community is the major stakeholder. 
the slum community. So we organized the slum community into slum dweller association. And then the, they, we, we, uh, we, um, we empowered them with the information, with the provisions in the new law, and then what we intend to do it. And then we take them, we took them on board, and then they are mobilized. They in turn, the slum dweller association, in turn involved all the uh, slum dweller families, well, dwelling families, on the all the households. They did their internal meetings, all those things. And then they, you know, uh, brought the community online with this uh, government's intention and the project uh, uh, objectives. So they are the main stakeholders. Then Tata Trust is our, uh, you know, state level partners. Tata Trust in turn brought in the technology partners like Adasta, the Home DR network, and then they engaged the technical agencies. They played a very critical uh, part. So at at all the levels, you know, we had partnership with the stakeholders in the in the in the, in the implementation process. Along with the community, the community uh, to handle the community, we engaged the NGOs, the community-based organizations, to help us in you know to mobilizing the community and then doing the house-to-house -house survey and then uh, uh, anchoring the entire process at the community level and help the community in uh, uh, documenting the whole process and then prepare the proposal which can be placed before the committee final committee for approval. So that is at the community level. Then in the implementation level. We, we had the support of the Tata Trust, supported by their uh, uh, partner organizations. And then they brought in the technical agencies like drone agency, uh, and then Spark, uh, Transfers, Jurong, they, are, they were the technical agencies. So we have the technology partners, we had the community-based uh, partners, and then we also had the government partners, you know, revenue administration, the collector, the sub-collector, the tasildar, the RI, revenue inspectors, so they are all our, uh, you know, implementing partners. This is one project we, where, where we, you know, involved uh, multi-level stakeholders at all levels of impl implementation. And we, we, we achieved excellent coordination, support from everybody. So everyone worked for the project. So we never call this as a government project. It's a program. It's a people-oriented program, community-oriented program, aimed at, you know, uh, 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 bringing up the uh slum communities so everybody put their heart and then it was a it's 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 a, it's a great success i can say thank you uh mr dash would you like to add to uh, uh what mr mativadanan mativadanan has said uh, because you in your you know response to one of my earlier questions you you also spoke about the stakeholders would you like to add something here yeah, uh, I think most of the stakeholders uh, he has covered, uh, but only one point I want to add is that uh, the Slum Dwellers Association or the Slum Community played a very important role in the entire process. They participated and they took the decision starting from the planning phase to execution phase and to monitoring and uh, the taking the decisions. So they were the people who took the decisions. Uh, like if there is a recommendation has gone from the because the who will get the land rights that is being decided by the slum dwellers association the proposal moves from them so proposal goes to the urban local body level to take a decision but again they are part of that to take the decision so in all levels because they are the part of the uh, the entire process of execution to evaluation and monitoring of the process and the quality control of the process so we like in the entire process so there are uh, less um, uh, mistakes or the errors that we found in the entire process um we have another question i think mr mativadanan is best uh, placed to answer this question and the question is from mr patrick mcclister and uh, the question is about the cost can you break down the cost of the project this is the question. Cost of the cost of implementing the project, we have not fully worked out. I must say that, uh, okay. as Cecil said, that you know, uh, uh, it worked out to about uh, rupees uh, eight hundred per uh, uh, title per uh, to for, for a family per household, consisting of about say five five members. But uh, I would say that from the government side, 
except the you know the cost paid towards the technical agency the the technical agency for engaging drone you know and, and then for paying to the uh, ngo or the community based organization for doing the house to house survey the other costs are very minimal or negligible i would say these are the two major cost the drone survey and map preparation and then uh, the cost paid towards the ngo for doing the house to house survey other than that we engaged the uh, various stakeholders within the government machinery and we used them and we have not paid anything for from the project okay so we are getting a large number of questions and most of the questions uh, happen to be uh, direct, directed at you mr mathi was uh, hope you wouldn't mind taking them one by one uh, uh, yes uh, yeah we have one more from uh, uh, mr nitin mishram and his question is this in nagpur the slum dwellers are getting land rights via government a government resolution how strong will that be with respect to uh, odisha rights act to slum dwellers he wants to know how does it compare with the uh, with the uh, odisha pro project and also you know uh, rights guaranteed through this uh, resolution how strong uh, the rights are going to be i think that's what he means by that question yeah i'm, yeah, I'm happy to know that uh, nagpur uh, uh, in nagpur slum dwellers are getting land rights via government resolution government resolution is a weak uh, you know instrument so tomorrow the government may change the resolution and come out with a fresh resolution stating that slum dwellers are not to get land rights whereas an act is a very cumbersome process it's a legal process it's a legislative process and then it it, it undergoes various stages and then you know and then you confer a statutory right on the slum dweller that's the uh, uh, you know uh, uh, strength of the act visa vis the resolution the citizen gets a legal right through an act suppose if tomorrow if we don't take up this exercise and then don't confer the land title with the slum dweller they can go to court and then challenge they can they can you know uh, get a direction from the court directing the government to take up the process and then confer the land rights within a time bound manner so that is the strength of the act it almost gives a irre irrevocable right on the citizen to get a uh, land right that's the difference i see can i also respond to this question please uh, please, please go ahead uh, professor bide please, exactly. please just a small addition uh, i think mr mathivatnan has kind of put it on the dot but uh, so coming from maharashtra and knowing the gr which has been passed i think the difference between the odisha act and the gr in the nagpur case is also that the odisha act gives ownership inheritable rights to the plot of land for every slum household whereas the nagpur gr ties the fate it first of all confers leads uh and it ties it to the construction of houses under pmay um uh, so you're giving things on one hand but at the same time making it very conditional the another aspect in the odisha land rights uh, act is that the government recognizes the slum the act also recognizes the existence of the slum and then uh, uh, that that means it gives the protection to the slum apart from conferring the land rights that's right that's right yeah uh, so uh, you know i have a related question uh, uh, you know uh, about uh, the similar programs being taken up uh, in other states uh, one of the one of the significance of this uh, project is that it has lessons for other states but uh, uh, i think it will be interesting to know how many states have taken uh, really uh, you know real interest in this so in your knowledge mr mathivadanan uh, uh, has any other state uh, approached you for uh, uh, for some help or whether they have been uh, you know following suit uh, uh, to to launch similar programs in india no several states have uh, you know uh, uh, taken their uh, taken the copy of our land rights and then they have discussed with us but so far we have mm -hmm. not heard from any state about implementing this or replicating okay. this model maybe the maybe the political will is still uh, uh, forthcoming there 
it requires a tremendous yeah. amount of will okay i think this this question is to mr dash you know you know a similar a, a related question uh, does the tata tata trust uh, have plans to scale this up uh, within odisha or other indian states yeah thanks narayan uh, in odisha uh, we are uh, covering all over odisha so all the urban local bodies are covered so in odisha it's completely scaled up so there is no more scope for odisha but in other states mm -hmm. uh, the documenting the documentation and best practices we have drawn from this project we are trying to present in other states and uh, um, the what are the processes has been followed because we have a, a complete team to document the process entire process uh, and uh, what worked out during the project what has not worked out during the project and what improvements can be done and what are the learnings that has been drawn from the project so but now because of the election uh, so number of states uh, we have discussed with two states uh, but uh, the initiative because of the forthcoming election it has not been taken up but i we are expecting that next financial year at least uh, four to five states will take this program uh, to a scale of states uh thanks thanks mr dash um there is a question about the gender dimension of uh, the project the question is again from mr uh, mesram and he wants to know uh, uh, are the titles given in the uh, jointly in the name of in the names of husband and wife uh, i think that is the case right mr mathivadan yeah, yeah yeah that's the case yes. and uh, uh so if uh, the it's a single uh, headed women uh, then the land rights will given to the women uh, but uh, we found in the field also one most interesting fact is that women are so happy that uh, because the land rights uh, land rights has been given uh, to both uh, the spa, women uh, the uh, wife and husband so in number of places women have complained that lots of male members they drunk and uh, they started uh, creating problem uh, in the family life and some of the places we found that uh, those male members they left for months together and uh, they came back uh, after a few months so women are now happy that uh, they have the right and they can now take the decision and they are part of the decision making process in the family okay so that's really interesting to know uh, we have another question uh, uh, this may be taken up uh, either by mr mathivadanan or uh, professor bide uh, the question is how did you avoid disenfranchisement of uh, the most vulnerable people in the slum uh, how did you avoid disenfranchisement of the most vulnerable people in the slum uh, would uh, no, mr mathivadan wants to go first yeah i think he yeah, should go yeah. for and i can add yeah you can join later sure sure yeah, I, can, I can take this see uh, the yeah. slums normally are covered by the electoral voter survey survey process though we don't give uh, you know the land rights or any other uh, uh, facilities or amenities but when it comes to election the the election machinery in fact has enumerated all the areas including the slum areas the slum dwellers are provided with the voter id card uh, and then they vote in every election so they have that voting right rights so there is no question of you know uh, retaking away their voting right already they have the voting right yeah. okay professor bide would you like to contribute yeah so in terms of just the addressing the most vulnerable i think there is no doubt that uh, slum areas differ like there are inter differences and there are intra differences uh, but i think one of the key principles that i found uh, which really worked is the way in which the land right has been worked out it talks of a minimum size of entitlement for everybody and then those who have larger spaces than that uh are then expected to pay uh at a uh, certain cost for the 
extra space that they have and that is a that for that there are conditions which are attached now this thing of defining the minimum plot area in fact has benefited several 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 households um, the second i think part of vulnerability um, that one also sees is slum areas which are considered untenable or those which are extremely um, I mean, yeah untenable perhaps and i think this is also very interesting to know that um, the decisions of untenability which otherwise in most cities what i have seen are made on very very discretionary parameters high value lands and the value of land the administration almost ensures that no slum dweller is able to access high value land but on the other hand here these have been made through the imposition of the ortho maps on the cadastral maps in order so for the first time i think the legal dimension uh, and a real dimension of objectivity has been added to the decision of tenability and untenability so these are two things which i have definitely seen which work towards the addressal of uh, vulnerability a final response is ki there are several settlements along the uh, eastern odisha belt which belong to uh, migrant settlements and these are migrant slums um again a very sensitive issue perhaps in several states of the country uh here the award of the uh, uh, land titles has ensured that these migrants get further integrated into the fabric of the city yeah we'll stop here okay uh, thank you we we have a question on the uh, technology the use of technology and i think uh, mr frank pichel is uh, uh, you know uh, is best suited to take this question uh, it's a simple question the question is how exactly was uh, whatsapp used uh, frank would you like to take this sure sure and actually i i will um, defer this one to shashir uh, because i think he can give a little bit more context to how it was used on the ground than i can so apologies to Shir for for dodging this one and passing it to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Uh, okay, Shir, would you uh, would you? No, no, that's my pleasure. Uh, uh, that uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, I would say the WhatsApp has played a very important role in the management and execution of the project. We are having about thirty-two groups, uh, starting from the implementation group to core group or to the groups in the districts. so these uh, groups uh, like uh, in the implementation group like starting from the district collector to the principal secretary to the joint secretary the director municipal administration the technical agencies uh, and the civil society organizations are part of that uh, group and uh, the the command uh, chain of command of the project uh, management is be is being accelerated because of uh, these whatsapp groups so immediately if there is because it's also a way that how transparently we can share the information also like if there is somewhere in a very small urban local body there is a issue then it has been immediately been flagged to the state level and immediately the rescue like the teams those who are they are immediately started rushing into we have different teams like starting from revenue team uh, then starting from the data management team uh, then data digitization team uh, so data collection team and uh, then uh, people who uh, actually takes the decision and uh, execute uh, the decisions also so different groups have started a convergence through these whatsapp groups so why i would say this project uh, one of the pillar of the success for this uh, project is the whatsapp uh, communication that took place okay and that's really interesting to know uh, we have a couple of questions uh, basically trying to uh, draw a comparison between this project and uh, 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 the question of land rights in rural areas so uh, the the question is somewhat like this and uh, uh, do you think the the same approach 
can be used in other scenarios like uh, non-slum urban and uh, rural titling, forest rights, etc. Uh, would Mr. Matibadanan uh, take this up? Professor yeah. Bide can uh, add to. Yeah, yeah, the same approach can be uh, you know replicated in other scenarios like non-slum. I I doubt that in urban area. Apart from the slum areas, the uh, we don't have informal settlements, or they, they will have only a sporadic settlement other than the slum. And these would be one or two houses, encro basically encroachers. So I think it would be uh, may not be advisable to take up this uh, process in that area. But in rural area for land titling, or in forest uh, area for the forest right. Yes, this uh, process can be replicated, very much replicated. And the ingredients of this act also can be made applicable. Basically, it uh, you know, uh, uh, this empowers the deprived people, landless, uh, those who are traditionally occupying that. I think uh, in the uh, following the same principles, uh, this that, that, that it can be replicated. But not in the non-slum urban, we will have difficulties. Thank you. OK. Uh, Professor Bide, would uh, would you have something to say about this? Just a comment. I think we may need to adapt technology, though certainly I think in uh, especially implementing the Forest Rights Act, where mapping itself of uh, particular titles has not been done very, very long time and different state governments are having various impediments. Sometimes these are human resource impediments. Um, so at that point, if we can adapt the technology to look at the forest areas, and I think it will certainly be very beneficial. Uh, on the adaptation to other urban areas uh, and understanding data with respect to that, um, I think whether it is possible to bring in different scales of settlements together, uh, it's a little doubtful process. So when I say ki it's a similar approach, are we referring to only the technology aspect of it? Are we referring to the mobilization of people? And here, both of these were critical because people had a stake in having that information, getting the maps done. Uh, there was a benefit which was attached to it. Um, in the rest of the city, there may also be threats to the existing level of um, benefits which are enjoyed by certain settlements. So there may, I, I, I think one may need to look at exactly what one means by saying this approach, right? And which component mm. of the this approach. That's right, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, so uh, Frank, I think this question is for you. Uh, so the question is uh, the GIS data created in the process can be used by other line agencies of the state government. How is it being used, shared? What systems are created for this? Is O R S E C involved? Uh, maybe Mr. Matiwadhan can also add. Uh, but uh, uh, Mr. Pichai, would you like would you like to would you like to start? Uh, Narayan, I can add to this. Sir. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, but uh, would yeah. Sure, ha happy to get started, and then, then I'll pass it off so we can dive into the sure, details sure, sure. Of, of how the state uh, agencies are using it. But you know, certainly one of the the benefits of using um, uh, the spatial tools and o um, open standards within the GIS is the ability to bring all of this data together, um, and through a combination of tools, making it relatively easy to interact with to do a lot of the, the core functions for state governments. Now, I'll, I'll probably leave it to, to um, Mr. Mathithananan to speak a little bit more in detail about what state agencies are doing what with the data. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the spatial data and the, you know, the household-based data collector, they provide precious information about the uh, slum communities and then uh, various aspects of, of their uh, living. So these data would be shared with uh, the line agencies, other departments, whichever department will require. So far, we have not, because since we are implementing this, we, uh, we have, so far we have not shared, but these data would be available for all the government agencies to use for uh, taking up various activities. And uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the process, I don't think we have used OSAC. 
orissa remote sensing uh, you know center i don't think we have involved in this uh, process we have engaged the technical agencies to do that we have not okay. maybe sir can add to this uh thanks sir the uh, mega the basically what has been the orsak has supported it is that with support from umidyar network we have organized test bed experiment for all the technical agency that has been participated in the bid so these technical agencies has been given one slum to draw the reference points so the reference point uh, uh, that value that we got from the orsak and orsak is a part of the process because in all the urban local bodies the reference points has been identified by the orsak so this data will be this data the special data as well as the household data that has been integrated the gis uh, into a gis platform so all these data we are trying to develop a web gis which can be utilized by all the line departments this can be open source information which can be used by all the departments so uh, if oh, the test bed that i have mentioned in nowhere in india this has been done anywhere for selection of the technical agency this is first time in india this has been done for selection of the technical agency and to measure how accurately the spatial data can be drawn okay so uh, that's about the use of data and now we have a question on the on the participatory nature of uh, uh, this uh, project the question is uh, has the slum development committee uh, been an executive body or execution body uh, and uh, whether all the decisions taken jointly by its members so this is the this is the question uh, i don't know who would like to take this uh, maybe shishi or uh, mati vadana yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, in uh, the slum dwellers association that has formed at the slum level, so each uh, slum, uh, each representative from each uh, people, those who are living in that slum, are member in that slum dwellers association. So, intentionally, what we have tried that at least 50%, more than 50% women members should participate in the slum dwellers association. Each slum dwellers association have a executive body. So this executive body is being nominated by the from the different communities. If a slum is having about 500 households, then uh, there are about 20 members those who are in the executive body. That has that decision will lead to uh, entirely to the slum dwellers association. and during the any decision that takes place it is not been taken place in the executive body maybe the preliminary consultations might have been done with the executive body but the uh, but the decisions has been taken by all the members consisting of uh, the, all the members the slum dwellers association okay so uh, so the the next question is about uh, some kind of rights uh, and i'm not too sure uh, uh, what uh, would this mean so uh, the question is how were renters rights managed yeah so this uh, is about the rights of renters yeah so i think uh, narayan i can uh, yeah. reflect this because uh, we faced this please problem yeah, when we started uh, execution of this project uh, in the slums we found uh, there are some people on the rent and uh, so we uh, saw that those uh, people are on the rent they should get the land rights not the owner the so called owner because this is a government land this is a, there is no owner to that land so whoever is living on that land if the evidences can be produced that uh, one is that his identity proof and the second is that uh, as uh, he or she is living uh, before the cut up date that is 10th august 2017 if this two proofs can be submitted by a person who is staying in the, in the rent in that uh, particular house then the uh, land rights will be given in the name of the renter not in the name of the so called uh, uh, house owner okay thank you uh, yeah i would i would like to add here that the problem please, of please. the you know slum landlords renting out 
the houses constructed by them illegally in government lands have been thought about at the legislation uh, drafting stage itself when we prepared the law that time it was thought about then accordingly we made a provision we we, we made a conscious decision that the person who is in occupation of the uh, land should get the land right not the person who was illegally constructed and rented out to that so whoever is living in that particular house if he produces the proof of uh, living there like because every family will have a, a voter id card with that particular address and uh, most of the households also do, do have the aadhar card also so the unique identity card so if their address is there and then they have been living there from before the cut off date only those people will get not the person who has rented out that will get so this aspect has been taken care of thank you okay so uh, i have another question from a participant in fact it was the first question uh, that we received uh, the question uh, is uh, how many data collectors uh, were trained on using the mobile app and how many people were trained to use the kedesta platform uh, i think uh, you know uh, frank would you like to address this or uh, is it sishir sure maybe i can take a, a first uh, yeah. first attempt and pass it off to sishir um, yeah, yeah. you know one of, one of the great things about about working with uh, the, this consortium was the fact that there's so much technical capacity both within the tata trust the government etc so the, the initial training on data collection actually happened uh, remotely um, and maybe about a year and a half ago uh, to with with Shashir and I and probably 10 to 15 data collectors um, and then we had another remote session or two but Shashir and his team were able to really lead a train the trainers approach and then then expand it to was it um i think 600 data collectors i'll pass it off to shashir and he can give the specifics of that approach to training of trainers i uh, yeah. as, uh, as Frank, uh, about 600 data collectors uh, were there who has been trained on the collect data collection digitization and uh, out of those 600 it is about 415 were women so that's very important for us because the data collection that took place in all the places women also took a very important role in the interview mm -hmm. okay so we we, we have uh, roughly around 12 minutes uh, left and uh, questions continue to come in uh, another question here which is about the the sociological dimension of uh, uh, the project i think uh, professor bide uh, will take this question uh, the the questioner wants to know something like this uh, if we relocate persons from two different locations from different religions uh, in one place how can we manage their rituals and spiritual activities or uh, requirements in one place uh, so uh, you know i think the the question is basically about the the the, the social mix of uh, uh, the slum dwellers and how it was managed uh, did it pose any challenge uh, you know how if, if so how uh, these challenges were managed can i can i answer yeah, yeah, this question yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah any, any one of you <laughs> Okay. So, so in, uh, uh, in this project, so far we have not relocated people from their mm -hmm. existing location. Number okay. one. Number two, so because right now we have given only uh, land rights or land titles on in situ basis, wherever they are residing. Mm -hmm. So we have not relocated. Second, in case if the land is untenable and we cannot provide in situ land rights, then we have plans to move them to new habitats that that is entirely a consent oriented process the community has to uh, give full willingness to that and then the entire community is moved entire slum is moved we don't pick people from here and there and put them in a place so it's a community process community decides to move and then say they identify the place and then in consultation with us of course and then they are they are also uh, you know uh, part of the planning process that who will reside next to whom the wall will be getting in a row of houses so they are part and parcel of the entire planning and execution process there is so there is no question of 
you know, uh, relocating people from different locations, different religion in one place. So it's not like a, a constructing a group housing and then selecting people from various places and putting them in a group housing scheme. This is different. We move a community. Community move en bloc. We don't leave out any one person there. And then we don't mix the communities also in the new uh, uh, habitat. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Mathiwadhanan, I, uh, I would like to extend this question uh, maybe by asking something which is not directly related to, uh, which is yes. what is the most ticklish issue that you have come across with all the technology, all the you know, uh, innovative features that you have included, and what are some of the most ticklish part of the project that uh, uh, you have come across and how did you address them? Uh... I have to discuss with Cecil to find out what was the <laughs> problem we have encountered in the entire, you know, one and a half years of uh, implementation. So I I don't think we have come across with any major hurdles. In fact, I would give credit to the solid uh, thought process that has gone into, uh, you know, making the legislation, making the act, which uh -huh. has considered all the uh, possible uh, field pra practical difficulties. Yes and incorporated in the act and the way we implemented the act right from beginning. So all we, 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 we tried because there was no benchmark, there was no uh, available template for implementing this, there was no precedence. So we devised everything and then the execution also evolved over a period of time. As we moved, the execution process also evolved. So we learned from our small, small mistakes and corrected and then moved forward. And uh, I would only give credit to the government that they have given us complete freedom and free hand to, you know, execute this in the field. And uh, we took inputs from uh, the partners and the stakeholders from time to time. And then we uh, incorporated all those suggestions to make this uh, successful. I don't think we had any uh, major implementation issues so far. Sisir can add to this. I can just add one point that uh, because uh, uh, the technology that has been adopted is new to the urban local bodies as well as to the civil society organizations. So building capacity for these people to acquaint with the, to adopting the technology took some time. So we are looking at that how this uh, massive uh, capacity building exercise that has been done, the um, uh, capacity that has been built for different stakeholders how to start sustain that beyond certain time periods that's the major challenge in front of us how we can sustain the community mobilization how we can sustain the adoption to the technology how we can sustain and continue this process beyond certain time period that's the challenge in front of us i think i can add one more problem which we encountered in some areas See, uh, in, uh -huh. in Orissa urban areas, we never had uh, in major, good, credible NGOs working in the field. Urban sector, unfortunately, did not have enough welfare program schemes uh, uh, involving the NGOs. So when we, uh, you know, involved the NGOs in uh, implementing this, we got several NGOs, but the capacities were lacking in, the, in many of the NGOs. In some places, uh -huh. the NGOs were absolutely hopeless somehow they got selected and then you we couldn't get rid of them they, we mm -hmm. had several non performing ngos unfortunately uh, become part of the uh, program which delayed the implementation process in those in, in those towns so we had to supplement the uh, you know the capacity and the resources from the state level we managed from the urban local body and reinforced the workforce and then somehow got the work done Otherwise, uh, that could have been very impossible. The lack of capacity of the NGO partners in several mm -hmm. towns were one of the mixing issues we had. All right. Uh, there's a related question here, which is, uh, is any refugee coming under this process or a right to get land right certificate? Uh, this may be about the background of the people who have been given uh, the rights. What kind of background check goes uh, into the whole process? So I can answer this question. As of now, we have not uh, uh, seen that uh, any refugees are being, uh, because uh, most of the refugees are being settled uh, in the rural areas in Odisha and uh, most of uh, 
uh, and we have not came across that but uh, the background check that three things we are trying to do is one is that the identity proof the second is that uh, whether he is economically backward or uh, not economically backward not economically backward class and uh, not economically backward but uh, economically weaker section or not economically weaker section and the third uh, reference check that is uh, the address proof uh, that whether the particular household is living before the cut off date in that particular slum or not okay so uh... I have a question to Mr. Mati So, uh, you know, one of the things that is emerging from this project as well as, um, uh, uh, you know, any, any other project which is a sort of governance reform project is that uh, these projects would succeed uh, only when there is a strong, very strong political backup. Now, what do you think is the source of this kind of a political, uh, you know, uh, backing for uh, a project like this? The pro this project is a vision of our honorable chief minister, Mr. Navin Patnaik. So this is his de decision. And then when we posed this problem before him that this is the vexing problem of the urban areas, unless we address this problem, the urban area, they, they will not be able to do justice and there won't be any equity in the uh, governance. So honorable chief minister has uh, realized, uh, understood the issue, magnitude. And then he said that uh, we should not wait for implementing this, this should be done immediately. And then that's why uh, when it was decided to go for a legislation, we took the ordinance route. We worked overnight and then brought the uh, legislation and then we didn't wait for the assembly to be convened to pass the legislation. We took the ordinance route and uh, with the governor's assent, we passed the act. Later on, it was ratified by the assembly. So the entire process got okay. over in a, in a few weeks time. All right. So, so uh, you know, with that, I think we have covered most of the questions. Uh, and uh, now I would like to ask the panelists, uh, would you like to offer, you know, uh, your final thoughts, uh, last round of comments, uh, each one of you? Uh, may I start with the Frank? Because uh, uh, Frank, uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, I have not, not directed many questions to you, so maybe you, you can start. Sure, sure. Happy to do so. Um, you know, there was one question that, that really resonated, and it was the, the question of, of replicability. Um, and, and I certainly think that a lot of the approaches used could be replicated in, in other contexts, uh, whether that's in forest reserves or peri-urban environments. Now, that's not to say there wouldn't be a need to contextualize and perhaps take a different approach. You know, drone imagery, for example, might not make sense um when you have larger plots maybe it's satellite imagery um so so i think there's a lot of scope to replicate the challenge of course is finding another another government that's willing to try new approaches in a in a field that tends to be conservative so let's hope that uh, others can follow the lead of uh, odisha state thanks uh Shishir, thanks thanks frank Shishir. Yeah, uh, um, I would say that uh, this would be a great project uh, for learning and uh, uh, leading the research uh, on land rights and as well as livable habitat. Odisha leads the way in becoming the first state to validate the need for uh, future forward technologies and uh, establishing that uh, not just the land rights but the livable habitat is possible. Uh, so it can be a great opportunity for the students, uh, researchers, uh, for the people, activists, uh, for the people, those who are working on land rights. Uh, uh, it can be a great opportunity for them to uh, build on the data uh, that is available because we found the valuable data that has been collected is uh, nowhere has been available. This type of uh, data is available. So one can uh, develop a very long uh, research process based on the data that has been collected. Okay, so, Professor Bide. Thanks, thanks, Fisher. <laughs> okay, see, I've been working on land and housing rights uh, with respect to slums in the country for some time now. Um, and the overall trend within the country, especially in the more urbanized states, seems to be that land rights are on the wane and there is an increasing emphasis towards monetizing the land under slums and converting slums into mm. property 
which will actually perhaps generate a whole lot of displacement itself. Uh, so we end up to in students in research we end up giving a lot of worst case kind of examples. To me, this is I think one of the emerging positive case examples that one needs to understand from, and perhaps also hope for uh, replicating it also in other opportunity states where urbanization is still at slower or moderate rates. Uh, Thanks, thanks. It's a nice way of putting it. Um, um, Professor, uh, Mr. Mathiwadhanan, uh, would you like to, you know, uh, give your final thoughts and uh, rather wrap it up? Yeah, yeah. We have now reached the uh, phase two of the uh, program. That yeah. the phase one of uh, giving land rights certificates is over almost on in situ basis. Now we have reached the saturation stage and we are moving to, you know. Uh, moving the people to new habitats wherever uh, the slums are in the untenable slums and uh, there are about 670 such slums in the state which are untenable and uh, about uh, 70,000 to uh, 100,000 families are involved required to be you know moved to new habitats and uh, about 800 acres are the land required to locate these families and the uh, this, the scope of work is huge we need you know more and more partners to support us this uh, it won't be so easy to be a, you know in, in fact a three four five years project we need to move them we need to give them uh, you know adequate infrastructure amenities services we we have to create the livable habitat and then bring the people to this with their consent there's a challenging assignment we look forward to have more and more partners to work with us. So I would like to use this platform to make an appeal to all that we need partners and uh, partnership. And uh, we, we we invite people to support us in this. Thank you so much. Thanks for the Thank opportunity. You. Thanks, Mr. Mativadhanan. And uh, with that, we have completely run out of time. And it only remains me to thank all our panelists and participants. Personally, I have benefited immensely from this discussion, and I hope our participants too uh, have benefited. Uh, thanks, everybody, and uh, have a great day or night ahead. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Neil.